Good afternoon, everybody. Our focus this afternoon is on features of the process by which schools find students with autism eligible for special education services. Our goals are to identify what some of the features of that process are, both briefly in healthcare settings and in education settings. We'll talk a bit about the members of the diagnostic assessment team and what their roles are in the process. And then something about characteristics of autism that have adverse effects on educational performance. And finally, we'll talk briefly about distinguishing autism and developmental, de developmental delay. Many of you will have encountered students who come to the special education process with a medical diagnosis of an autism spectrum disorder. Such a medical diagnosis typically occurs in a healthcare context, a place like a, a developmental pediatrician's office or a mental health clinic. It is generally driven by criteria from the DSM, uh, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And a medical diagnosis of an autism spectrum disorder is usually provided by a licensed healthcare professional often a developmental behavioral pediatrician or a pediatric neurologist, a child psychologist, or a child psychiatrist. And typically that process will involve some observation of the child and some interaction with the parent, particularly around the questions of, develop of developmental history. Having said that, it, we should acknowledge that diagnostic practices vary widely uh, across uh, medical professionals. Uh, and that's probably evident in the reports that come to you as school professionals uh, from such a, a medical evaluation. I wanted to just mention briefly the uh, DSM criteria. And I've drawn here on the proposed criteria for autism spectrum disorders from DSM-5. Uh, as you know, DSM-5 is not yet released. Uh, and Officially, we are still working from the DSM-IV criteria. However, in practice, many medical professionals are using the criteria as they are explicated in DSM-V because they are, they are probably more consistent with the current scientific literature. I'm not going to address these in detail, but just want to alert you to uh, sort of the outline of the, of the definition as it is in DSM-V. The criteria include, first of all, that the, a child has persistent deficits in social communication and social interaction across contexts that are not accounted for by general developmental delays. And secondly, that the child displays restricted repetitive patterns of behavior, interests, or activities. Now there is, under each one of these criteria, considerable elaboration in the DSM definition, and I would just refer you to DSM dsm5.org if you're interested in more detail about this definition. In addition then, the DSM-5 proposed definition requires that the symptoms be present in early childhood. It indicates that for some students with autism spectrum disorders, those characteristics might not be, um, might, might become as evident until uh, later in a child's development, when the social demand, what, as expressed here, the social demands exceed limited capacities. In practice, what that sometimes means is higher functioning kids who show up at kindergarten and that that's the point at which their difficulties become apparent. And finally then, that the symptoms together limit and impair everyday functioning. This speaks to the fact that uh, an autism spectrum disorder is only diagnosed if the characteristics have some impact on the child's ability to function in the everyday world. I mentioned these two points specifically because they have corollaries in the educational definition that we want to, to speak to in some detail. We move then to the educational diagnosis of autism. And I'm drawing here, the text for, for these next few slides comes from a guidance from the Virginia Department of Education. The definition of autism in the special education context means a developmental disability. First of all, that significantly affects verbal and nonverbal communication and social interaction. That sounds a great deal like the first of the criteria from DSM-5. Secondly, that it's generally evident before age three and, find, and that it adversely affects a child's educational performance. 
There is an additional criterion that's not specified in this definition that we'll come back to in a little bit and that has particular importance. The Virginia Department of Education definition goes on to say that other characteristics associated with autism include engagement in repetitive activities and stereotype movements, resistance to environmental change, or change in daily routines, and unusual responses to sensory experiences. The guidance further indicates that the educational diagnosis of autism doesn't apply if the child's educational performance is adversely affected primarily because the child has an emotional disturbance. This is an important point, particularly for some of the higher functioning kids, because it is often the case that these students will, in fact, have uh, some form of an emotional disturbance, as, as well as, as an autism spectrum disorder. Uh, many of the, of the students will experience uh, anxiety. Uh, in, in particular in school context, they may experience uh, uh, mood differences that would be diagnosable. But the point of this, this feature of the, of the definition is that there, in order for a child to have an educational diagnosis of autism, there need to be characteristics that we identify as, com as uh, features of autism that are distinct from those that we might attribute to co-occurring uh, mental health concerns. The guidance then further says a child who manifests characteristics of, characteristics of autism after age three could be identified as having autism if the criteria in this definition are satisfied. And again, this is a corollary to what we saw in the DSM-5 definition in recognition of the fact that some folks with an autism spectrum disorder who are quite capable, uh, who are intellectually able or even gifted, uh, the characteristics that we associate with an autism spectrum disorder may be relatively later appearing or at least relatively later, uh, re recognized relatively later in a child's development. To return then to the process of special education el eligibility, and so we, we've, I, we've talked briefly about what's the definition of an autism spectrum disorder for special education purposes. And now we think a little bit about what's the process by which a student is found eligible uh, for, for special education. This will be familiar to many of you, but the process, is again, drawing on the text from a guidance from the Virginia Department of Education, requires that the, the uh, eligibility team review information and observations about a student, that they determine the need for individual assessments and observations, that they review and interpret the results of those assessments and then make an eligibility determination. That's just a general sort of overview of what typically happens as a child moves through the eligibility process. I mention this though because this guidance also indicates that if the review of existing data uh, supports the suspicion of disability and indicates that there really isn't any further need for assessment, the team can proceed with the eligibility process without further assessment. And an example of a situation in which this might happen would be when you as a school team would receive reports from another school or a private provider, uh, and the guidance says that, that such a report would include content that reflects the educational needs and provides information about an observation and needs for specially designed instruction. And so this just notes that the process can in fact go forward where there is sufficient data available from other sources, and that might be another school system or a private, private provider, in order to document that a child meets the criteria for special education and for, more specifically, for the disability category of autism. The guidance then further says the child may be found eligible for special education and related services as a child with autism if there is an adverse effect on the child's educational performance due to documented characteristics of autism. I emphasize this because we want to look at some of the characteristics of autism and I want to challenge you particularly to think about what is the impact on a child's educational performance that might follow from these characteristics of autism. Secondly, the child found, may be found eligible as a child with autism if the child has any of the pervasive development disorders, also re referenced as autism spectrum disorders, and it further go goes on to further detail which those are. Autistic disorder, Asperger's disorder, PDD, NOS uh, are, the, are the primary ones.
This guidance document then further says that a child with a medical diagnosis of autism must be found eligible for special education and related services under IDEA. And the point being made here is simply that a medical diagnosis by itself is not sufficient as in order to uh, demonstrate eligibility for special education services, that the law still requires the school system to go through the process of finding the child eligible um, according to the uh, regulations in, from, the, from the Department of Education. Children who are suspected of having a disability should be referred to their local school division for evaluation and initiate the process for determining eligibility. And that uh, is a process that will be familiar to many of you. Just a few words then about this question of educational identification and medical diagnosis. Another guidance document from the Virginia Department of Education makes the point that a diagnosis that's included in a report from a medical professional isn't sufficient to make an eligibility determination, we just said that, and that the eligibility committee needs to consider information from multiple sources that document the presence of an impairment the adverse effect on educational performance. And this then is the additional criteria that I, re that I referred to earlier. In addition to documenting that the child meets criteria for a diagnosis of autism, that the characteristics that we associate, that are, that are uh, a part of that, that presentation of autism have an impact on educational performance. In addition to that, the eligibility committee is required to demonstrate that there is a need for specially designed instruction. When a medical diagnosis is presented, the eligibility committee is directed to address the difference between educational identification under IDEA and a medical diagnosis and to review the criteria for the specific disability category. The point here is that it falls to the eligibility committee to make clear for a child who has a medical diagnosis of, of an autism spectrum disorder to make clear in what way that child's disability affects his, his or her educational performance and what is the specific need for, for specially designed instruction. This probably presents a, a challenge to the healthcare field in the sense that it would be, it is a, a help to the eligibility committee if a healthcare professional who provides a, a medical diagnosis of an autism spectrum disorder will go on to detail at least some information about this, about the ways in which this, this child's characteristics of autism are likely to have an adverse impact on educational performance and to what extent those characteristics might suggest a need for specially designed instruction. Because that's what eligibility committees have to, have to demonstrate. And finally, I would say that, that, that uh, that's what eligibility committees really need to be making clear to parents because parents are often confused about this often confused about this question of what is the difference between an educational uh, identification and a medical diagnosis and eligibility committees can address that question by speaking clearly to the way in which this child's presentation of autism pre presents an adverse makes an adverse effect on educational performance and uh, demonstrates a need for specially designed instruction. The guidance further goes on then to say that the student may meet the criteria for um, educational identification as a child with a disability without having a medical diagnosis. So it's clear that uh, a child does not have to go elsewhere to receive a medical diagnosis in order to be found eligible as a student with a disability and in our, this case specifically as a student with autism. And it's also possible for a student to have a medical diagnosis but to not meet the criteria for educational identification as we referred to just a minute ago. So we want to think then briefly about what is the, what is the process by which a school professionals might go about doing a diagnostic assessment for an autism spectrum disorder as a part of a comprehensive eligibility assessment. My thoughts about this are, are drawn from a model that we've been working on over the last number of years and suggests a way in which one might go about, the way in which school systems might go about providing such a diagnostic assessment. Typically, diagnostic determination is going to include a number of key components. 
one of them being clinical or behavioral observation. In most cases, in a school context, this will occur in the classroom. We're going to need report from parents and from teachers about child's characteristics, about the child's characteristics, again, in the classroom, but also in the home, in the family, in the community. This model suggests that we need a structured diagnostic assessment instrument to provide a more objective look at the child's behavior in, a, in the context of a diagnostic evaluation. And finally then, that we need multidisciplinary team input. An eligibility committee is by definition multidisciplinary. This refers to the fact that we, there, are, there are specific functions that the various disciplines represented as a part of a diagnostic team might serve. And we want to talk briefly about what those functions are then. So the question of who is on a diagnostic assessment team, again, this uh, th these thoughts are reflective of the model that we have been working at over the last couple of years. And it distinguishes a diagnostic assessment team from an eligibility committee. That may or may not be true in any given sort of individual uh, educational system, uh, but the point is that the functions are slightly different. That there is a diagnostic assessment process that happens that leads up to an eligibility process. Uh, one way or the other, there is some uh, diagnostic assessment um, activities that contribute to a decision about a child's educational diagnosis and uh, need for special education services. So who is on that team? I put parents first because parents are, provide critical information about the child's developmental history and about the child's characteristics and functioning in home and community contexts. And all the various definitions of autism spectrum disorders out there make it clear that in order for a child to be identified as a student with an autism spectrum disorder, it's important that this child manifest those characteristics in all contexts, really across the board. And so we're looking for information about how the child manifests characteristics of autism at home, in the community, in a restaurant, in church, in any of a variety of settings that, that the child finds himself functioning or maybe sometimes not functioning so well. Secondly, as members of the, uh, the team, we're, we include teachers. Teachers provide critical information about the child's characteristics and functioning in the school context, including in the classroom, in the phys physical education context, in the lunchroom, and before and after school, between classes, a variety of, of um, important information about this child's general functioning in, in the school context. A psychologist typically provides information about intellectual and adaptive functioning and often about the specific characteristics of autism spectrum disorders based on some uh, more objective diagnostic assessment instrument. We include as a, an important member of a diagnostic assessment team a speech therapist. Because communication is one of the central features that is often affected in students with autism spectrum disorders, we need a, a speech and language professional to, to provide information about the child's communication characteristics and functioning. How does this child deal with communication demands? What are the challenges that they face in terms of, com of communicating to others, both uh, uh, listening to what others are saying and expressing uh, their expressing what they have to say to, to others. We've also acknowledged the importance of an occupational therapist, therapy professional on the diagnostic assessment team. As someone who can provide information about the child's sensory and motor characteristics and functioning, recent definitions of autism spectrum disorders have emphasized the importance of sensory processing differences in many of the kids on, on the spectrum and it's becoming, I think, more and more apparent what impact those sensory differences have on kids' ability to function in the world and frequently as a basis for challenging behaviors that might occur. And finally then, we identify the important contribution of an educational diagnost diagnostician, providing information about pre-academic and academic characteristics and the child's uh, academic functioning in an educational context. <laughs>
that's not necessarily uh, exhaustive, but it's certainly some of the, uh, the professionals that we assume are, are important, have an important contribution to the diagnostic assessment of a student with autism. We might ask then, what does this team do? What, what, are the, what is their job? And in part, it is going to be some individual assessments uh, to the extent that those are indicated. Uh, there's, this model suggests that there's a need for a joint participation in some specific diagnostic assessment procedures. We have promoted the idea of, of a team observing the administration of a structured diagnostic instrument so that you can have, one can have multidisciplinary uh, uh, reflection on the characteristics that the child presents in, in that context. And then arriving at a consensus regarding a di autism diagnosis to recommend to the eligibility committee. Again, this may or may not be the way it works within any one individual school division, but it's a, it is uh, an indication of what are the functions that need to be need to occur as a part of the process of identifying a child as a student with autism. So when we conduct such a diagnostic evaluation. We're interested in, first of all, I suppose, determining whether or not the label of, of autism accurately describes a child's challenges. Is, in fact, this label of autism and the definition that goes along with it, is that a good description of what's the, what is the child's central difficulties and the way in which they, they impact on the child's ability to function in, in school? But the label of itself is really only the very first step of a diagnostic assessment. And more importantly, is it's going to be this diagnostic assessment team's responsibility to state clearly how this particular child meets or does not meet the defining characteristics of autism, as well as clarifying which associated characteristics are true of the child. And so certainly some of those features that that have come to be identified as often present in kids on the autism spectrum, but maybe not, uh, maybe not part of the diagnostic criterion. We want to identify which of those associated features are present and which are not. And in this way, we're going to document the presence of an impairment. That's the first of the, of the requirements of the eligibility process. So we have to document that this child has an impairment and that it is, it is of the kind that we associate with the label of, of autism. Next then, as we said before, it is the, the function of this diagnostic assessment team to document the adverse impact on educational performance and the need for specially de designed instruction. And in a minute, we're going to look at some of the characteristics and think about how we might go from those characteristics to impact on performance and need for instruction. Finally, then, it's the, it is the task of the diagnostic assessment team to map out, at least in broad terms, what is the direction for intervention, as indicated by those identified characteristics. This doesn't mean that the, the, the team is writing the individual's IEP, even before the eligibility, but at a minimum, it is probably the diagnostic assessment team's function to say these are the kind of things that, the kind of interventions that this child is likely to benefit from in terms of educational instruction. I'd like to take then some time to look at some of the characteristics of autism with an eye toward what, how do these features impact educational performance and indicate a need for specially designed instruction. The text on these next few slides is drawn from uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics guidance document. And I use this because I, it is a nice sort of um, accessible description of current literature on characteristics of autism. I think it captures many of the, the behavioral features in a way that the diagnostic criteria don't do because they're, they are not as detailed, not, not as specific. It isn't a comprehensive list, uh, but it is. it provides us with common characteristics that are often seen in children on the autism spectrum, a variety of different levels of functioning that we'll, we'll address specifically. And it allows us an opportunity to say, so what impact might this have on a child's educational functioning? And so, for example, one of the first ones that, that is mentioned in the American Academy of Pediatrics document, children with autism often do not appear to seek connectedness. They're content being alone, ignore bids for attention, seldom make eye contact, or bids for 
or bid for others' attention with gestures or vocalizations. This is a way of describing what we might think of as sort of a classic presentation of autism. It speaks to these children's likelihood of being, of appearing very alone and not necessarily seeking out um, social interaction. In some cases, maybe even actively avoiding that. And I mentioned this one and spend a little time on it because it is, it's probably one that's relatively easy for us to say, we can see what's the, what is the impact that this, that this kind of a presentation will have on educational performance. A child who ignores bids for attention is not going to do very well in an instructional context. And so it's likely that, that that's going to be an important feature in describing this child and beginning to set the stage for how we are going to intervene with the child. Further, one, we might say that a child who ignores bids for attention gives us an immediate sense about one of, the, one of the preliminary goals for this child in terms of specially designed instruction. We are going to have to design some specific instruction to teach this child how to attend to bids for attention. That, that's when, when a teacher speaks the child's name, that the child has, the, the expectation is that the child will orient toward the teacher and make eye contact. That's a skill. It's a skill that many young children on the autism spectrum with a classic presentation don't demonstrate and that is, is often a part of the very early uh, goals of, of intervention. So some other uh, expressions of this kind of classic presentation consistently fail to point to comment at age appropriate times and when they do less likely to show positive affect and connectedness during the act. This is an expression about, about establishing joint attention using a, a point to draw someone else's attention to something of interest, um, not, not to request but rather to comment on something uh, and to, to engage positively around that, to, to enjoy the fact that we are together uh, attending to something. Um, and once again, this is one of those features that has come out in the literature on young children with autism um, that distinguishes them from children with other kinds of de developmental disabilities. Another one, fail to orient to social stimuli, in particular to turn consistent, consistently to respond to one's own name. This is a very specific kind of thing that, that uh, again, has served to distinguish children on the autism spectrum, very young children, uh, from kids with other kinds of disabilities. The question being, do they uh, turn to uh, respond to their own name? Some other features that we associate with a, a more of a classic presentation with autism, particularly in young children, some of the, the pre-speech deficits that we see in these kids are lack of appropriate gaze, lack of warm, joyful expressions with gaze. I mentioned that one specifically because this is an example of one that's maybe a little bit harder to say, okay, so what is the impact, the adverse effect on educational performance of failing to establish a warm, joyful expression with gaze? We might have to work a little harder to, to make that kind of a connection. And so not all of these characteristics are necessarily have a direct impact on educational performance. The next one, though, is a good, good example of one that does, a lack of alternating to and fro pattern vocalizations. If a child doesn't have the notion of reciprocal vocalizing, it's going to be really tough to establish communication. That, that's a basic sort of form, basic precursor of verbal or other forms of communication, that we have to understand this idea of back and forthness, of reciprocity in, in the communication act. A disregard for vocalizations, a lack of response to the name, uh, even though the child is, is keenly aware of environmental sounds, a feature that, again, is seen often in, in young children uh, with a classic presentation. Decreased or absent use of gestures. Uh, this is something that, that is, is an important sort of distinction of an autism spectrum disorder from a presentation that's primarily a language delay. That Kids with, with language delays or language disorders will often find other ways of communicating their point through gestures, um, through pre-speech gestures. And the scientific literature suggests that kids on the autism spectrum, uh, in addition to what other communication difficulties that they might have, are also uh, deficient in their use of nonverbal communication and gestures.
For children who have language, we might find that, that their speech is not functional or fluent, lacks communicative intent, might be scripted. And so this takes us to a slightly different presentation in terms of, of a child's communication uh, difficulties. If you have uh, encountered a number of kids on the autism spectrum, you can probably call to mind those for whom their speech, they have lots of speech, but it isn't particularly functional for the purpose of communication. That it seems to serve some other function, maybe not entirely clear what that is, uh, but kids who will repeat television commercials, uh, who will uh, engage in, in just stereotypic repetition of words or sounds, um, and so are demonstrating speech, but that it doesn't really serve it as, as a communication function. Again, we might diverge just for just a moment to think about impact on, adverse impact on educational performance. A child whose speech consists entirely of the dialogue from the Little Mermaid is not going to be very functional in the classroom. And we're going to have to teach that child other ways of using their, their speech capacity in order to benefit from educational instruction. Another example, utterances can be more precisely articulated, have a more monotone quality, or consist of larger verbal chunks. And this is kind of an extension of what we were just talking about, that the speech of a child with autism, while the speech act itself might be intact, the utterances might sound odd. Uh, they might be different in terms of articulation, in terms of, of uh, intonation, uh, and again, then in terms of, of just repeating uh, chunks that, that, are, that come from some other source. Kids on the autism spectrum are often observed to demonstrate echolalia, repeating words uh, verbatim. Uh, and it's maybe important to distinguish this kind of echolalia from the typical echo echoing that occurs as a part of language development. Those speech therapists out there can probably do a better job of this than I can. But certainly, we expect young children who are just learning to speak to echo at some level, to repeat words that we say. The echolalia that's associated with an autism spectrum disorder is often not immediate. It is often repeating things that were heard at some previous time and typically are repeated with the exact intonation and often without, um, uh, maybe without a particular function in the immediate context. And so uh, the, the content of the verbalization really doesn't match what the, what the environmental situation calls for. As we move on up, then, in terms of communication ability, we might find kids who are very verbal about a, about a certain topic of interest, but that are missing the ability to communicate about other important things, like, uh, like feelings, uh, being able to express feelings, being able to acknowledge others' feelings uh, verbally. And beyond that, then, the, the, the capacity to recognize that other people might have a different viewpoint. They might be feeling differently or thinking something differently. This goes to that literature on theory of mind. The, as, a, as a, one of the core disabilities of many kids on the autism spectrum, the incapacity to recognize that others have feelings and viewpoints that differ from their own. For some children, the speech might be fluent, but limited to only a few topics. And so you will, we often encounter kids who are very verbal again, but who, whose entire, the content of their entire verbal output is uh, focused on a very specific uh, interest that may or may not be true for the people in, that the child is communicating with. And so children who will talk on and on about dinosaurs or about uh, elevators, uh, these are, are kids who may, may be able to speak quite fluently, but that their, their speech is limited to topics that are, that are of interest. Speech might be overly, formally, over, overly formal. This is a characteristic that's often associated with Asperger's disorder and uh, is, serves as a basis for the, the designation of these kids as little professors. They're, they're seen as pedantic in the sense that they kind of go on and on, like some professors we might know. Uh, and who and, and are um, not necessarily responsive to feedback from from the listener. Another set of characteristics that that might apply to a child's communication differences are those things that we associate with pragmatic language, choosing topics of conversation, uh, 
understanding and producing uh, appropriate tempo, facial expression, body language, taking turns, recognizing when the partner's lost interest in a topic. These are the kind of things that, that are critical skills in effective uh, social engagement. That there are things that, that are built into our communication that we often don't think explicitly about, but that just sort of happen automatically for most of it, most of us, and that probably that don't happen automatically for many students on the autism spectrum. Again, just to think for a moment about impact on educational performance, we can easily see that these, th these kind of pragmatic language issues are going, to, are going to interrupt a child's ability to be successful in the classroom. Uh, and we might, we might think particularly with respect to educational activities that require working with peers. That if a child doesn't have these pragmatic language skills, it's going to impact on their ability to work together with peers, uh, a skill that's often critical to kids' success in, in the classroom. Some additional things and are, are kind of similar, difficulty sustaining a conversation on a topic that's initiated by another, and so being unwilling to, to uh, attend to topics that are not um, one of some of my particular interests. Language might seem odd or self-centered. Uh, there might be a unique delivery of speech called prosody with regard to intonation, volume, rhythm, pitch, and personal space that tends to dis disregard the listener's needs. Again, this is one of those things that we often associate with with children who meet criteria for Asperger's disorder and suggests that there are, in some cases, more subtle differences of, of kids' communication, <clears throat> but differences that might be responsive to specific instruction, to specific direction, to practice communicating in a slightly different way, and that these, are, these differences in communication are going to have an effect on the child's ability to be successful, again, in the classroom and particularly in work with peers. There's a set of characteristics that we associate with play. And uh, I would mention a couple of those as they present in a more classic sort of autism. Uh, lack of or significantly delayed pretend play skills coupled with persistent sensory motor function, sensory motor and or ritualistic play. And so this alludes to the fact that many young children with autism, again with a more classic presentation, fail to sort of grasp the idea of pretend in play. And uh, when their peers are trying to engage in pretend play, they may not, they either may not be interested or may not be able to successfully uh, join them. Play might be repetitive, lacking creativity, uh, imitation. Children might be content to play alone for long periods of time, uh, requiring little attention or supervision. Uh, and then some examples of what that kind of play might be. Might enjoy chase games, roughhousing, uh, but the, with, with a particular enjoyment of the sensory sort of aspects of, of these activities rather than, than the social aspects. I mention this one in particular because it's, it is not uncommon to hear from parents or from teachers that a child must not be a student on the autism spectrum disorder because they appear to enjoy playing tag. Uh, and playing tag is a good thing. Uh, it is not always a, a terribly social activity, or at least there are social aspects of, such, of a game like that that might elude a child on the autism spectrum, that they might enjoy the sort of the physical nature of the activity, but miss out on the social parts of it. Kids on the autism spectrum often have trouble interacting in groups and cooperating uh, in more sophisticated games, often left out or ignored, uh, or even victimized or bullied by peers, uh, less likely to have appropriate peer relationships, uh, to have the kind of friendships that we would expect uh, of a child uh, of comparable age, and likely to have few or no friends. I would stress these for just a moment in terms of thinking about impact on educational performance as critical parts of the school experience. And so it emphasizes the fact that students with autism are often vulnerable to victimization by other students and that it is a part of our job as professionals to ensure that that isn't happening uh, and that, that kids are protected from, from bullying. Further, I would say it's a part of our responsibility as, as professionals to ensure that children have the skills to 
manage situations that might lead to victimization or to bullying. And this takes us to then to this to the impact on on functioning in a school environment and to the need for special instruction around those skills that would help a child to make their way through difficult circumstances which might include situations that could lead to, to bullying. A child might have some atypical behaviors like mannerisms. Again, this, this takes us back to a more classic presentation of, of autism. Mannerisms being things like unusual physical movements, unusual attachment to objects, obsessions, compulsions, self-injurious behaviors, and then the, uh, the AAP uh, document goes on to specify what some of those might be. Uh, it's not uncommon for these to occur relatively later than some of the early characteristics or the social characteristics, and so many of the stereotypies that we associate with autism are more likely to occur, to appear after three years of age, might include things like finger flicking, unusual eye gaze, uh, toe walking, uh, persistent sniffing or licking of, uh, of non-food objects, and self-injurious behaviors. These are, the, are clearly behaviors that are going to interfere with a child's capacity to attend to instruction in an educational context and to benefit from that instruction. And so these represent appropriate goals for intervention, that, that we should understand what is it that drives these characteristics, these behaviors, uh, and that we should be able to, to produce interventions that are going to help the child to uh, overcome those, the behaviors, or at least to suppress them in a context where they are actually interfering and to be able to attend them to, to the, educational, um, the educational context. A child might have uh, restricted interest in objects, topics, or facts, and sometimes, sometimes those um, interests themselves might not be unusual, but what's different for this child is that the degree of interest that it's abnormal. I emphasize this one because we sometimes find that, that the characteristic that fits a child's um, uh, fits a child into this, this third area of repetitive behavior and stereotype interest is interest in something that, that many kids are interested in, like uh, Pokemon or like uh, video games. Uh, and what distinguishes this child's interest is the intensity. And so if we find that a child is only interested in a video game and is only interested in talking extensively about how one proceeds through the levels of that video game, whether or not the listener is interested, and is incapable of sort of uh, communicating about other things, we might say that is a manifestation of this third area of, of uh, um, criteria that we associate with autism spectrum disorders. I want to close then briefly by talking about uh, the distinction between autism and developmental delay. And I mention this was specifically because it comes up in consideration of, of disability category for young children. As we know, young children who are identified as eligible for special education may be identified as students with developmental delay rather than one of the more specific disability categories. And so eligibility committees are typically confronted with the, the task of making that distinction, making a decision about what's, so what is appropriate for this child. We think this is a child who is on the autism spectrum. Do we go ahead and identify that child as, with that disability category, or do we identify the child as a student with developmental delay? So here are some basic assumptions, and this is, I suppose, reflective of, of, a, of a personal opinion, but they are assumptions that I think are consistent with the general tenor of the, of the law and the regulations. Um, regarding special education. So a child's disability category is an individual decision, should be based on student characteristics alone, and more to the point, uh, should not be mandated or limited by school division policy, either explicit or implied. I mention this point because I have heard of school divisions that have taken the position that no child under the age of seven is identified as a student with autism, that they are always identified as a student with developmental delay, and that the autism category is not applied until uh, developmental delay is no longer available. My position on that is that it is a mistake, that, that to mandate such a, to have, have a, an explicit policy to that effect violates the intent of, of the law, which is that a child 
disability category will reflect the individual characteristics that, that the child presents. A third basic assumption is that the disability category, whatever it is, should not mandate or limit the services that the child receives or the classroom placement in which those services are offered. And again, I think the law is pretty clear about this, but practice is sometimes variable. And I have certainly encountered reports of, of indications of students who are either mandated into or restricted from a specific educational context because of their disability category. And so, with regard to this decision that, that the eligibility committee faces, when does it make sense to choose autism? These are perhaps uh, uh, straightforward and, and maybe go without saying, but when the child clearly presents with characteristics consistent with an ASD diagnosis, it makes sense for us to identify that child as a special education student with autism. And further, when the label of autism offers the most helpful shorthand way of understanding and explaining the child's presentation and behavior. And so when we want to emphasize that it is the features that we associate with autism that are presenting the most significant challenge for this child's ability to function in, the, in a school context to benefit from instruction, then we do well to identify this child as a student with autism, to make explicit the fact that the features that we associate with autism are of primary importance in, in educational planning. When then would we say that it makes sense to choose developmental delay in the, child, in the case of a, con, of a child uh, who is uh, eligible for a developmental delay designation? First of all, when the child's characteristics are not clearly consistent with an ASD diagnosis, we might say there are certainly some kids who are in that gray area and for whom we say, well, the fact is this child appears to meet the criteria for a diagnosis of autism for an educational disability category of autism, but it's really less clear than we might hope and that we would be more comfortable saying we're going to call this, ch uh, this child a student with developmental delay and observe the child's uh, uh, evolution over, over the course of the next chunk of time <clears throat> in order to make a decision about, about an autism diagnosis. So when, when, that is, when the characteristics do not clearly identify uh, an autism spectrum diagnosis, it might make sense to choose developmental delay. When, as I've said here, contrary to good sense, good practice in the law, an autism disability category would require the child to be served in an inappropriate setting. My hope is that that really isn't happening in any educational context out there, but I've certainly heard reports that, that if a child is given a disability category of autism, that requires them to be placed in a specific classroom that is for students with autism uh, and, that, and that that classroom might be inappropriate for that child. Finally then, we might choose developmental delay when a child's parents resist the autism disability category uh, despite good faith efforts to try to communicate how this child's presentation warrants that, that uh, diagnosis and despite reassurances that the label will not negatively affect the child's access to appropriate education. It's probably, in such a kind of case, it's probably not worth getting in a fight with children's parents over this. That in fact, if we can, for that student, call them a student with developmental delay and provide all the appropriate services for this child and write appropriate goals, meeting the kinds of characteristics, that, even though we associate them with an autism spectrum disorder, that we may do well to avoid that fight um, where, when, it can be, when it can be avoided. Finally then, I would say, that what is, our, what is our hope out of all of this process? That our, certainly the goal is that in the end, we will, a, a successful diagnostic assessment process will yield an educational program that has a couple of key features. One is that the whole team can endorse. That is that while we may not all have exact agreement about uh, exactly the way in which we arrived at this decision, that we can agree together that this child has these kinds of, of difficulties and that we're going to put together a program that will address those difficulties. Secondly, a program that acknowledges the way in which this child's autism spectrum disorder is manifested. How does autism manifest itself in this child? What are the specific characteristics that we're observing? And the program then provides appropriate accommodations to reduce the impact of, of the disability. That is, we acknowledge that because of these specific characteristics, we're going to alter the environment in specific ways in order to improve the child's chances of success in the environment.
Thirdly, the prog a program that identifies goals to address the challenges and limitations that the child faces. These may be things that are specific to characteristics of autism. They might be the associated features that we mentioned earlier, but they are goals that specifically address the kinds of things that, that are causing this child difficulty succeeding in an educational environment. And finally then, a program that provides interventions that is aimed at, at achieving those goals. If we can come to that conclusion, I think we will agree that we've been successful in uh, negotiating the process of, of identifying a student appropriately for as a student with an autism spectrum disorder and have uh, come up with a, an educational program that's going to meet that child's needs. Thank you very much. I look forward to uh, noting your comments and responding to them.